Um, welcome to the latest IOS study data on COVID-19. Uh, my name is Rosalind Kemp. I'm the Secretary General of the IUIS, and uh, more importantly, I'm in New Zealand, so I'm on the same time zone. Um, today we have two speakers, Professor Sharon Lowen, who is the inaugural director of the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity in Melbourne, Australia, and Professor Catherine Kidzieska, who is the laboratory head in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the Peter Doherty Institute. So Sharon is an infectious diseases physician and scientist and her research focuses on understanding why HIV persists on treatment and developing clinical trials aimed at ultimately finding a cure for HIV infection. Catherine is an NHMRC Leadership Fellow and Group Leader of the Human T-Cell Laboratory at the Doherty Institute, University of Melbourne. Her researches, research interests include human T-cell immunity to pandemic, seasonal and newly emerged influenza viruses. She also studies human immunity to SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 patients. And she published one of the first research papers in 2020 describing the immune response in COVID patients. And that's work that we'll present today. So because we have two speakers, um, we'll start with an overview of the Australian Pandemic Preparedness Strategy from Sharon. Then we'll move directly on to Catherine's research presentation. And we'll hold questions for both speakers until the, the end of the presentation. So Sharon, welcome. Thanks for and thanks to the IUIS for arranging it and it's a great pleasure to be part of this webinar and to be presenting with my colleague and friend Catherine Kuzerska. Um, as you heard from Roz, my background is as a clinical infectious disease physician and virologist with a long track record. But I'm now the director of the Doherty Institute which has been very active um, in the response to COVID-19. And so what I thought I would do as a brief introduction before Catherine's talk is to tell you a bit about what we did in Australia, what the pandemic looks like, and some of the lessons about being prepared and how it paid off, I think, for Australia, but also particularly for the work we do at the Doherty Institute. Now, I know that COVID-19 looks very different in many countries and I can see from the members and people on the call today, each of you will have, have experienced a very different time over the last few months with some countries being very severely hit by COVID-19 with extraordinary impacts on their healthcare system and on their populations. And so I wanted to share a bit with you about what happened in Australia because Australia's had a pretty um, interesting response and I would say um, quite a successful response. And this is our epidemic curve um, showing a peak in cases of COVID-19 in late March. I um, mean, purple shows you the source of infection being overseas, in blue, locally acquired, and in green of unknown origin. So you can see in Australia that we were undergoing an epidemic increase up until late March and then following quite significant social restriction um, and physical distancing, we've seen a progressive decline in infections. And in fact, since April the 21st, we've had less than 30 cases per day. And in the last 24 hours, in the last 48 hours, less than 10 cases per day. Pretty extraordinarily small outbreak for a Why our epidemic has been so limited. There's been a few key factors that have led to a um, excellent outcome in Australia. First of these was um, travel restrictions from mainland China that were instituted early on the 1st of February. Um, second was some um, public health restrictions blocking um, large gatherings that were instituted early. And third was an incredible number of testing that was done across the country starting in late January. And in fact, in a country of 27 million people, we've done 1.3 million tests. 
Uh, positivity rates 0.6%, which is one of the lowest in the world. And in the state where Catherine and I live in Victoria, about 4% of people have been tested. And I think what's more extraordinary that even with these low numbers, we're still working in a um, environment of physical distancing and our restrictions are really just beginning to relax on June the 1st, um, which will start, we still don't have open restaurants, for example. The other reason that we've done well is that I think we were scientifically prepared, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that story from the perspective of the Doherty Institute. So first of all, um, our, we diagnosed the first case of COVID-19 in Australia at the Doherty Institute on January the 24th. The work was done by Julian Druce and Mike Catton that you can see here, who head one of the largest public health reference laboratories which actually sits within a public hospital inside the Doherty Institute. So we have a public health reference laboratory right next to our researchers, which I think is an incredible arrangement. This was Friday evening of a long weekend. Um, Julian is a very expert virologist. Upon the first diagnosis, he checked that this was the case by doing full length sequencing and then proceeded to attempt to culture COVID-19 and I think was surprisingly lucky because he actually isolated SARS-CoV-2 on January the 29th from the first patient diagnosed. And what was unique about that um, isolation was that it was uh, the first time the virus had been isolated and shared outside of China. In late January, no one had access to the live virus outside of China. Vidral and Julian and, and Mike decided to rapidly share that with over 100 different laboratories around the world. And I think although subsequently many labs were able to isolate the virus, the rapid sharing really did accelerate people's capacity to evaluate tests, begin to develop antivirals and begin to develop vaccines. At the same time, um, we were also quite well prepared in Melbourne at least because of another study that had been established by one of our clinicians, Dr. Irani Thavarajan. She had established a study back in 2017 called the Sentinel Travelers and Research Preparedness for Emerging Infectious Diseases, or CETREP-ID. And this is an observational clinical trial of return travelers that has a low disease phase, or essentially when, in when nothing much is happening on outbreaks and an emergent phase ready to tackle a new pathogen. And the primary objective of this study was to enable early research in non-travellers and travellers in the context of a disease outbreak in order to inform early clinical and public health responses and to establish a research platform that could be upscaled rapidly, efficient, efficiently and with flexibility. And Irani was able to activate this platform in early January, meaning by the time we had cases in late January, we could enrol them in observational clinical trials. And Catherine will tell you about the first patient enrolled in this study, leading to her very nice work in characterising the immune response to COVID. Cetrap ID um, it has intensive sampling in the first week of enrolment and then follow up at day 28, three months and six months. The first participant was enrolled on January the 30th at a time when we only had five or six patients diagnosed in the whole of Australia. And since that time have um, enrolled 19 participants with ongoing follow up. So a very good example of the need for preparedness. The world will of course be different post COVID-19, but allowing us to do important research from the very early diagnoses in Australia. And finally, there's another network that I've been heavily involved with, again involved in preparedness, which I think has led to a great outcome in Australia. This is the Australian Partnership for Preparedness Research on Infectious Disease Emergencies called a PRIZE. I lead a PRIZE, which is a nationally distributed multidisciplinary research team spanning public health, laboratory science, clinical research in key populations. And our network was actually established in 2016 with five years of funding to divert, develop research capacity for preparedness and response. So this set us up very well for COVID-19. We already had been working extensively together, more than 50 investigators and 20 organisations across Australia. 
with established partnerships with government organisations and public health response arms. And some of the work that's emerged from a prize, particularly mathematical modelling led by Jodie McVern, has been advising our governments on the best public health responses. So I think this is a good news story from Australia. Of course, we haven't done everything perfectly. There still are many challenges that all of us face in not only managing this pandemic, but being prepared for future pandemics. I want to set the scene for you of what life's like in Australia for us currently. And I'll now hand over to Catherine, who'll tell you a bit more about the immunology that arose from those very early clinical trials we were able to establish. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sharon, for um, such an excellent introduction. And I'd also like to thank IUIS um, for the invitation. Really delighted to present to you some of our um, recent data. So as um, Sharon mentioned, our journey into um, COVID-19 research has started late January uh, when um, our lab, my lab, received the first um, blood sample from one of the one of Australia's first patients, first COVID nineteen patient. Um, the patient was a previously healthy forty nine year old woman who um, developed symptoms of COVID nineteen seven days after she arrived in Australia, um, coming from Wuhan in China. The patient presented to the hospital um, on um, four, uh, four days after um, disease onset and on admission and as well as day five and six, SARS-CoV-2 was detected by um, RT-PCR. And um, we um, have received the blood samples um, to analyze the breadth of immune responses um, in this um, one of Australia's first um, COVID-19 patients. We've received blood samples on um, day 7, 8, 9 and 20 after disease onset. And um, here you can see four people from my lab who played a key role in understanding immunity um, to SARS-CoV-2 in, in this patient. And that's one, Marius, Caroline and Xiao Xiao. Um, so um, the first essays we did um, were flow cytometry based essays um, using a small amount of blood and um, using um, panels that we could um, get as much information as we could from a small um, amount of blood. So firstly, we looked at um, antibody secreting cells, AAA, ASCs and follicular T helper cells. So antibody secreting cells are short-lived um, B cells known to produce um, known to produce high amounts of antibodies and, follic and follicular T, T helper cells obviously help B cells um, to um, produce those antibodies. Um, and as you can see here, looking at the pink arrows on day seven after disease onset, we've noticed quite distinct, although still relatively small populations of antibody secreting cells and follicular T cells. On day eight, we got very excited as those, um, those populations of both antibody secreting cells and follicular T cells um, markedly um, increased. And uh, we know from our experience um, of, that we gathered over the last six years um, studying um, patients hospitalized with influenza viruses, then once we see such a substantial increase in antibody secreting cells and follicular T cells, the patient usually recovers within the next three days. And that's actually what happened in this COVID-19 um, sample. The patient was discharged from hospital on day 11 after disease onset. And um, looking at the kinetics of antibody secreting cells and follicular T cells um, during COVID-19, um, we actually um, noticed very similar results to what we have previously um, shown in patients hospitalized with influenza viruses, as you can see on those graphs. So in the COVID-19 
19 patients um, together with um, antibody secreting cells, follicular T cells. We've observed progresses in progressive increases in plasma IgM and IgG antibodies. As um, you can see here, um, shown by um, immunofluorescence, antibody staining for both IgG and IgM um, that bound to SARS-CoV-2 infected viral cells um, using patient's plasma. Apart from humoral um, responses, antibody secreting cells and follicular T cells, obviously cellular immunity, um, conventional T cells, CD4 and CD8 T cells are important uh, in recovery from different viral infections. Um, so this is why we also analyzed um, CD8 and CD4 T cells by co-expression of two key molecules in um, activation um, towards viral infections, and these are CD38 and HLA-DR. And again, as um, you can see uh, within the gates um, pointed by the pink arrows, um, especially from day eight, um, we, we, we observed really substantial populations of those um, highly activated both CD8 and CD4 T cells. And importantly, within those CD38 HLA DIA positive, double positive cells, when we um, looked at the expression of cytolytic uh, molecules like granzymes and per perfrin, which indicates the killing capacity, um, as you can see in the, in the graphs, in histograms, um, in colors, um, blue, pink, and purple, uh, we, we, noted, we observed um, high proportion of um, granzyme A, B, and perfrin within those CD38 positive HLA, DIA positive CD8 T cells, and to a lesser extent in CD4 T cells. So really in this patient case, in this case, um, um, the, the patient, the patient, um, the patient had um, textbook uh, immune responses um, pr uh, preceding um, the, the recovery. Um, and what, what those immune responses did they really control nicely um, inflammation um, in this patient? Um, so we we've when we look at the what um, broad range of cytokines and chemokines, we found no dysregulated cytokine chemokine profiles in blood of this patient, as you can see here on the seven eight nine um, after disease onset. Um, so obviously that was a mild to moderate pay, um, patient case, um, but that required hospitalization. Um, last week, um, a really nice paper um, came out by Zheng et al, um, came out in Nature. And what they found was when, com when they compared asymptomatic, mild, severe, and critical um, cases of COVID-19, that really in critical cases, there is an increase, there are increased levels of both IL-6 and IL-8, and those cytokines are associated with really severe COVID-19 disease mm. and inversely correlate with lymphopenia. And such high levels of IL-6 and IL-8 mm -hmm. um, uh, in um, severe COVID-19 patients are really similar in um, severe avian influ to those in um, severe influenza, um, avian influenza disease. And as you can see here, in, especially in people that die from avian H7N9 influenza, those patients also have high levels of IL-6 IL, and IL-8, um, possibly um, suggesting similar underlying effects of cytokine storm. So um, having analyzed 
um, one of the first um, patient cases in Australia. We were obviously were interested in looking at the broad at, at a number of patients across a broad range of disease severities and ages. And here uh, um, is my team that was involved in the work, um, understanding immunity in across different um, number of patients. So apart from the CETREP cohort um, uh, and the platform that Sharon um, really nicely described, um, we also um, have another cohort called DISI cohort that we have established uh, um, since um, in 2014. Um, as our main um, focus in the lab is to understand immunity to influenza viruses. Um, so with this cohort, um, we, um, we, mm -hmm. this is an active cohort with active um, ethics. Um, and um, we, we do capture um, patients infected with new influenza viruses. Um, and the cohort allows us to um, capture patients with any respiratory infections and influenza um, uh, in like illness. And if you um, look at the pie charts in um, in a year that's not not 2020, we usually get two thirds of our patients um, being um, flu infected individuals, and the rest of them um, having other respiratory infections. Obviously, um, that. Um, change in 2020 and a week after um, we received blood from the first central patient we got additional two cases um, through the DZ cohort mm -hmm. and there was a patient um, that was um, patient 60 uh, number 73 it was a 63 year old um, female and we received blood at day four and six after mm -hmm. disease onset and patient 74 um, who was a 25 year old female and we received um, bloods on day two and day six and um, the results we were very happy um, to see that the results were really similar to our first reported case, especially when you look at patient 73, a 63-year-old um, individual, um, you can see a really beautiful substantial uh, populations of both antibody secreting cells and activated follicular cells, as well as activated CD8 and CD40 cells. The same happened in a younger patient, um, but those um, populations uh, were smaller. So um, now to date, we have analyzed close to 100 um, patients, both at the, some at the acute time point, um, some at the convalescence, and um, for several, um, and um, we do have longitudinal sampling of quite a few of those mm -hmm. patients. So here I'm presenting to you um, our, the summary of our data uh, for um, 33 acute patients, um, our first four convalescent, convalescent patients, and 49 healthy controls. And as you can see, during the acute COVID-19, um, there is a significant increase in both proportion and a number of antibody secreting cells, as well as follicular T cells. But what you can see within those uh, COVID-19 acute um, patients is that there is a broad range of proportions and numbers of um, antibody secreting cells and follicular T cells, which is now um, we, we are um, currently um, compiling, um, compiling um, this data with um, clinical data um, to really understand um, how high levels of antibody secreting cells or follicular T cells um, correlate with the disease outcome. Similarly, we found increase across um, a number of patients. We found in significantly increased um, proportions of 
highly activated CD38 positive, HLA-D positive, CD8, CD4, and gamma delta T cells. So obviously cellular immunity is important, but so are antibodies. Um, to really get um, a bigger um, picture of immune responses um, in COVID-19, we establish um, ELISA, um, receptor binding domain serology ELISA that was really p um, pioneered by Fatima Amanat and Florian Kramer from Mount Sinai. Um, and um, as you can see, it um, uses the color um, based detection system um, using um, plasma, uh, patient's plasma. So um, we've analyzed our um, 100 donors now. And what you, what you can see um, in the majority of the donors, um, we do see um, the, we do see um, RBD specific IgG, IgG antibodies. Um, the majority of the patients, with the exceptions of two, um, had um, were zero positive. In contrast to healthy controls, they, they who really have low levels of RBD um, specific IgGs. Looking at the IG, I, IgM, um, the majority of patients are positive, but so are a few um, healthy controls. And what we found um, in the recent collaborative um, um, were a study with um, Amy Chang um, laboratory, these are mainly um, children that can have some pre-existing um, IGMs. Uh, we also, in a selected um, number of patients, we found RBD-specific IGAs, and we still um, are correlating those with um, disease severity. So, in summary, um, what we found is that in um, the majority of the Patient of patient cases with mild to moderate disease. We found robust immune responses in the peripheral blood of COVID-19 patients, and those um, usually precede the recovery um, for uh, um, three uh, around three days. Um, and these cells include antibody-secreting cells, follicular T cells, CD38 positive, HLA-D HLA positive, CD8, CD8, CD4 T cells, as well as gamma delta cells. We found that um, the majority of the patients seroconverted, and that's by assessment of um, RBD IgG antibodies, um, although patients do also have RBD specific IgMs and some IgAs. Um, the CD38 HLA-D uh, CD8 T cells express high levels of granzyme and perforin, um, suggesting, indicating the um, high um, cytotoxic capacity. And uh, we find no um, cytokine dysregulation in mild to moderate patients. We did have a couple of patients that were in ICU and our um, data so far suggests that these patients had increased levels of IL-6 and IL-8. So our study um, obviously is an important step um, towards understanding what drives recovery from mild to moderate disease. And uh, we provide an understanding uh, and it provides a basis for understanding what's lacking, impaired, or overactive in patients with severe or fatal COVID-19. Um, and the, a really important key question now is, well, uh, more and more patients now in the world establish um, B cell B cell immunity, T cell immunity have um, antibodies, um, quite a of the uh, quite a large 
proportion of the patients have um, antibodies with neutralizing activity. Um, how long lasting is this immunological memory? How do we establish, uh, how can we establish immunological memory? How long lasting it is? And can such uh, immune memory um, T cells and B cells protect us from the subsequent um, COVID-19 disease? And with that, I'd like to um, thank a number of people. Um, so obviously my amazing team, um, we have a number um, of uh, collaborators at the Dorothy Institute. It's been a really unique and wonderful time to be a part of the Dorothy Institute um, with um, a broad range of expertise and everyone working together. We collaborate with a number of people in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology, University of Melbourne. Um, we are part of the CETREP ID that Sharon described. Um, collaborate with um, clinicians, uh, infectious disease specialists, um, the WHO Center, Sharon provides insightful um, feedback and I'd like to acknowledge uh, our collaborators at the Alfred Hospital, Alan Cheng at Tomokon Symbols and at Fudan University for the H79 data I showed you and our founders. Thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you both Sharon and Catherine for some great presentations. We've got a really long list of questions so I'll try and organise these um, a bit more broadly first and then we can get into some specific questions. Um, the first question I have is actually for Sharon and that was um, just a question about how the federal versus the state government have handled the lockdown and how they work with your prize program. I know you did have a slide on that. Is there, is there a difficulty with that or is that work well, fine? Yeah, interesting question. So Australia um, has a federated health system. So we have five states and two territories and each, so basically if you look at the American system, it's like governors of a state and they're the premiers and they actually determine policy. So the policy in my state of Victoria of restaurants currently being closed um, is different for the policy in New South Wales where Sydney's located, where restaurants are open. And, you know, I have always thought that our federated health system was a negative because you had six or seven people making decisions and and no, and no and the person at the top, meaning the Minister of Health, can't really boss all those governors or premiers around. But in COVID-19, I think it's been an advantage um, and there's been a, a few things that have worked really well. Um, quite early on, our Prime Minister created a national cabinet, which is unique where he meets with all the premiers, in fact, I think daily, to discuss national policy. And so that allowed for cohesion and a good decision. So things like, um, you know, finding PPE or testing was decided at a national level and in partnership, but yet there was some diversity. So Victoria or Melbourne and Sydney always had more cases than anywhere else in the world because we have more international travel. And so our policies here don't necessarily have to be the same in the west of the country with far fewer travellers. Also, the other thing about Australia is, of course, we have Indigenous people. About 3% of our country is Indigenous. Indigenous people have um, very high rates of heart disease, diabetes, obesity, all the risk factors that lead to worse mortality with COVID-19. They also are at increased risk for a number of infectious diseases, particularly influenza, but we don't know COVID-19. So there needs to be some special rules around areas where there's high Indigenous people. So I think the state-federal balance has worked surprisingly well. We work with both at a prize. Um, we get funded from both. That's the advantage as well. You've got the federal government that have provided us with quite a lot of money, particularly around for a prize itself, $7 million now, and um, a, an initiative around improving our testing capacity. At the same time, that local health department provides good um, funding as well. I think the one area that the that's weak in the system is it can conf cause confusion in the public. So closing schools has been a really controversial is issue in Australia. Some states saying close, other states saying open, and then the public thinks, well, you guys don't know what you're talking about because in Sydney you can go to school and in Melbourne you can't. 
Um, and I think that is an area. But you know, in these in these decisions, often in public health, King schools open or not, restaurants open or not, hairdressers or beauticians, all these sorts of decisions, they're not all based on firm evidence. And so that's why there's a bit of confusion. But I think for COVID-19 in Australia, it's worked for us well. I see what's happening in the US and actually, um, you know, previously I always thought the US was very unified because of the CDC, but you're seeing enormous variability um, amongst all the governance responses. So it's a bit of experience for, for us. Thank you. Um, Catherine, there's some several questions about your talk. Um, I'll sort of start with some of the, the broader ones, as I said. Um, have you looked at persistent patients? Did you find any persistent patients to look at? Um, so we've got like longitudinal samples um, from quite a few patients, but um, the, the, the cases that we usually get a mild to moderate and patients are discharged from the hospital within a few days after um, admission. Okay, cool. Um, one of the questions is about one of your earlier slides which showed a decrease in all of the immune cells after days eight to 10. Um, and so that's sort of related. Does this mean that you could infer that the immunity isn't persistent? Um, so w what we were looking at, what we detected were activated CD8, CD4 and gamma delta T cells. And we actually, um, the, the, so the activation is transient and it's meant to be transient. We know from our work with avian influenza viruses, so that patient who had prolonged expression for over a month of CD38, HLA-DR double positive T cells, they were in trouble and the majority of those patients died. So prolonged ex over expression of those um, activated phenotypes um, are associated with severe disease. Uh, one question that I also had was, have you looked in depth at the innate cell response in these patients as well? So we've looked at monocytes um, and NK cells and we found no differences in the, the cases, mild to moderate cases that we've had. Uh, one question and I think from the literature... Yeah. No, <laughs> and I think from the literature, um, yeah, there were not many there are not many changes in um, monocytes within the patient's blood uh, one question that's come up several times is um whether the secreting antibodies are actually neutralizing or not you had a, a footnote in one of your slides about uh, neutralization would you be able to comment on on the ability the the antibodies to actually neutralize the virus Yes, so we, we find, um, so Kenta Subaru um, tested um, antibodies, neutralizing activity of the antibodies in um, our patients, and the majority of them had some level of neutralizing activity, some more, some less, but we do find a great proportion of patients with neutralizing antibodies. Okay, good. Um, was there any evidence of exhaustion of the T cells? including the follicular health cells? No, not in our patients. Uh, we, we do have PD-1 and other markers in our panels and um, yeah, not in non-severe cases. Um, this I think is a question probably for both of you. Do you think it's going to be possible to make a prediction of the outcome, so recovery or death, based on the immune profile early in the disease? I, I might answer that. Um, I, uh, I don't think there's any evidence that you can at the moment predict. We know the risk factors for who's more likely to get severe disease. So certainly the elderly over 70, people with hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, they're all risk factors for getting severe disease. Um, what the, as a clinician, what you see is um, that severe disease presents in the second and third week, so it presents late. And most of the longitudinal studies, as Catherine highlighted, we haven't studied severe disease closely here amongst our investigators in Melbourne, but I've, you know, there's a lot in the literature. 
um, that you get um, worsening disease in the second and third weeks when there's less viral load, certainly in the nasopharyngeal swabs and sputum, and you get this increasing dysregulation, as was shown in the paper in Nature, with high levels of IL-6, IL-8, and, um, and then uh, probably a lot of severity is now thought to be complement-driven and um, coagula coagulation abnormalities. And it is very unclear at the moment the predictors. But if you have some really nice longitudinal data sets like the, some of the cohorts Catherine is describing with good sample collection, good clinical data collection, um, a lot of people trying to answer this question, what could predict severity? That would make a very big difference. As we use more antiviral treatments, um, certainly some of the treatments suggest, some of the studies suggest that if you use antivirals earlier, um, you may you sh shorten the time to recovery and potentially that would lead to the reduce the chance of getting severe disease. So that interplay between virus and triggering an aberrant immune response is still not really understood. Um, from a treatment perspective, how is it um, how's it being treated how are patients being treated to diminish that cytokine storm? So I well, there's a, six that have been published. But. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the approaches have been to block the cytokines that are implicated. The most data is on using drugs to block anti to block IL six or to block the receptor. Um, small studies. Uh, I think there's one randomized trial. Uh, another that hasn't been published. One that says it works. Another that says it doesn't. The treatment landscape is very uh, confusing uh, based on whether the studies are large enough to find a difference and whether they're randomised. So the early studies of locking IL-6 look quite promising because you put people on those drugs and their IL-6 reduced, their CRP reduced, some of them got better, but you have to have a control arm to answer the question. Um, Anti-IL-1 is being trialled. I haven't seen any results of that. And then there are other anti-inflammatory drugs that block signalling pathways like JAK-STAT inhibitors, baricitinib. There's a big study of baricitinib um, as, an, as a um, strategy. Uh, steroids, there's mixed results, but I think overall the recommendations are not to use steroids. And um, given that all the, all the interventions at the moment are experimental, um, certainly here in Australia, and my view as a clinician is that these experimental agents are best tested in the context of a clinical trial because really, even though there's a flood of clinical trials out there, we have very few large, adequately powered trials to know whether interventions work. Did you want to comment on um, plasma therapy as well? Yeah, plasma therapy um, theoretically um, has a theoretical basis, of course, convalescent plasma from people who recover and have neutralising antibodies. We now know that nearly everyone has neutralising antibodies um, post-recovery, but it's the TETA that might be important. So some studies have measured that TETA and then given convalescent plasma when neutralising antibodies are above a certain TETA, Again, those studies have been small, um, non-randomised, look safe, um, and the larger studies are being rolled out. The other approach is to use hyperimmune globulin and to isolate the um, SARS-CoV-2 specific antibodies from people that have recovered. And then finally, I think probably the most promise is being held still for monoclonal antibodies is a far more refined way of treatment than convalescent plasma. Um, has there been investigation of whether asymptomatic patients also develop neutralising antibodies? There has. Um, there are um, mixed studies on what correlates with high levels of neutralising antibodies. There's one study that looks, shows, I know one published and one unpublished, that shows higher neutralising antibody teeters with severity, so more severe, more neut high neutralising antibody teeters. There are other studies that show higher neutralising antibody teeters with age, and so I don't think the two have been separated yet because older people tend to get more severe disease. So I think that's really interesting.
one theory is that that's related to antigen. I'm not sure I've seen data convincing to say it's high levels of antigen that drive neutralising teeters. But certainly higher teeters neutralising antibodies in severe disease and people that are older. Um, the, just a new question has come up just on the age too. Is it, Catherine, did you find differences in the immune response in adults versus children? You mentioned that briefly, that you had a couple of younger people in your cohort. Yeah, so, so in a separate study um, that I have not presented today, um, we looked at pre-existing immunity to COVID-19 across the human lifespan um, in children, adults and elderly. And we found um, that um, children had um, some cross-reactive IgMs, so quite immature antibodies, uh, whereas these were elderly people that had higher levels of pre-existing antibodies, and they were mainly IgAs, which was quite unexpected. Catherine, there's a couple of questions about your ELISA essay. Was this in-house prepared or is it commercially available? So, well, it was based on Florian Kramer's essay. Mm -hmm. um, so Florian, um, so Florian shared really in real time his protocols and his reagents. Um, we, we got his reagents protocols and um, established the essay and quite a few laboratories in the world are using um, um, the essay published by Florian and others. Um, and um, we, we do get similar results to the other laboratories using his reagents. Um, a question to follow up from that is, in Europe, many of the patients that were COVID positive didn't develop antibodies. Is that possibly due to the sensitivity of the tests that were used? So the majority of the patients developed um, IgGs, uh, but not IgAs and IgM. Okay. Um, have you looked at the course of the immune response against any of the drugs that patients were treated with? Or have others? No, that's Sharon. You may. Um, well, I'm using antiviral drugs in Australia that are not licensed for COVID nineteen. You know what we call repurposed drugs like Kaletra and HIV drug or hydroxychloroquine. Um, is available in Australia, but strongly discouraged outside of clinical trials. So I would be very surprised that any of the patients that Catherine studied received a specific antiviral. I don't know the result of that. Interesting question. I haven't seen any antibody, um, antibody studies uh, uh, in the treatment studies. Now, the treatment studies are only just coming out, and the only treatment study that I've seen that... Um, has I mean the, the you know the, the most the most interesting treatment studies I guess are remdesivir that's um, come out uh, in a recent paper published on the weekend with over a thousand participants and a shorter time to recovery from fifteen to eleven days and a non significant reduction in death. Um, I don't. It'd be very interesting to see what those um, what the antibody profile was like. My reading. And there are now some pretty big studies. There's another nice paper in Nature Medicine that looks at antibody levels longitudinally. By day 21, nearly 100% of people will have IgG and about 90% of them will have IgM. And most of them will have neutralising antibodies, but the TETA will vary. So my reading of the cohorts published and also some work we've done here and when you interpret antibody literature, you have to look at the day that it was measured. And so if you look at day 14, it's around 80%. If you look at day 21, day 28, it's really close to 100% will have antibodies on ELISA, on immunofluorescence and neutralisation. We've done some large evaluation panels here by our colleague, Professor Deb Williamson, who's tested both point-of-care tests and um, and commercial ELISA tests and 
people will see it is unusual to not see a convert is from my reading of the literature with hundreds of people it's been but what's key is the day that plasma is collected so by day 21 really most people will have igg Catherine, based on your research, what's your what are your views in reference to possible vaccines and immune status to prevent reinfection? Mm. <laughs> is, is it, it is one million preload? dollar? <laughs> yeah, question. Um, I, I I think it's really promising that, as Sharon said, every the majority of um, of the patients do develop antibodies, they develop neutralizing antibodies, which always is really promising um, for vaccine candidates, um, as long as the vaccine can do it as good as the nature. I, I might um, just add, oh, yeah, oh, so I'm just going to add um, some interesting monkey work that was published recently in Science showing that um, in monkeys that led by Dan Baruch from Harvard um, Medical School, that our monkeys that were infected and then re-challenged at day 28, they were all protected, and it was related to anti-development of neutralising antibodies, not a T-cell response. And then a follow-up paper showing that with a DNA vaccine in these macaques, um, they were protected, uh, and it, the correlation was related to level of antibody. So that's in macaques. Um, we don't yet know the answer in humans, but um, that's certainly encouraging. Um, Catherine, is it possible to look for antigen-specific T cells? Have you tried that or have others? Yes, a number of laboratories are looking at antigen-specific T cells at, at identifying um, specificities for both CD8, CD, for T cells, a couple of papers um, started emerging um, in bioarchives, med archives. Um, so um, my prediction is in the next couple of months we'll have some nice um, T cell specificities um, so we can make tetramers and um, follow um, establishment effect or T cells establishment of memory and they recall after subsequent infection. Um, I have an interesting question here about whether the virus can actually influence T cells directly. So is there any evidence that the virus can interfere directly with T cell or T cell function? There was some, um, uh, there have been a few, certainly there's um, T cell loss. So declines in CD4 T cells have been described in severe patients, patients with severe disease. And there was an, uh, it's sort of, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I haven't seen this published. I saw it in a preprint that the COVID-19 could infect T cells. Um, I don't think I've seen it published. I'd be surprised because it needs the ACE2 receptor and I'm pretty sure there's no ACE2 on T cells. Is that right? I don't know, Catherine. I don't think there is. Um, but uh, I mean, what is surprising is how many cells can be infected by COVID-19. And the finding of COVID-19 in autopsy studies in endothelial cells, in tubular cells in the kidney. Um, you know, ACE2 is widely expressed. I'm quite interested to know what, how does it get there? So you've got ACE2 in your lungs and you become systemically unwell. In fact, you can rarely find it in all the most reports show that you rarely see it in plasma. Um, haven't seen much, many reports of PVMC. How does it circulate around the body to infect other cells? But I don't haven't haven't don't think I've seen that published of infecting T cells. Um, so we're we're almost out of time. So I think I'll finish on on sort of one last question that's that's also got some theoretical basis to it, which is um, so the question is looking at the immune data available for the first reported case. Would you say the patient mounted its immune response de novo? So I guess what they're asking is whether is there pre-existing immunity in people to other coronaviruses. What, what's your opinion, both of you, on, on that? Um, I, I was going to ask Catherine this question. When you get a response in a normal 
patient that hasn't been exposed to COVID-19, I would interpret as non-specific background, not necessarily pre-existing immunity. So I was interested to hear Catherine's view on why she calls it pre-existing immunity, not non-specific binding. I mean, most IgM tests have non-specific binding. And so if someone, we generally cut off for your um, tests are usually related. I mean, uh, most of the cutoffs of the test of what's a true positive or not are based on pre-COVID plasma samples. So I was fascinated to hear Catherine describe that as pre-existing immunity. It's a new virus. I would have thought and you get much more cross-reactivity with nuclear protein, not much with RBD, but you'll always get some background of non-specific binding. So I'd like Catherine's interpretation of that. Is it cross, is it pre-existing immunity or is it just non-specific binding and background of an assay? Um, so in the study with Amy, we, I guess you don't know because you don't have um, privileges, but um, the IgA said we found high levels of IgA antibodies. Um, so we measured um, pre-existing pre-existing immunity, what we call in pre-pandemic samples to um, SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-1, all the circulating coronaviruses, MERS, and so on. And there seemed to be a le level of cross-reactive immunity in pre-pandemic samples. And those were IG high levels of IgAs, which suggest to us um, maybe elderly have been um, exposed um, more times to circulating coronaviruses to build up this pre-existing immunity. But also in patients that we um, that we um, assayed in the lab, some of the um, some of the samples we got on day two post disease onset. And some of those patients had high levels of IgG antibodies, which there could be a week between the infection and disease onset, but that still makes day nine post infection. So that's really early for high levels of um, specific IgG antibodies if they were to be elicited de novo. It, it's hard. It's hard to know which one it is. It might be a bit of both. Um, we're we're pretty much out of time, so um, I'd just like to thank both Sharon and Catherine for your presentations and for answering all of the questions. Um, the questions are still coming in, so um, I think if you go have a have a look on your YouTube channel, there'll be lots of comments for you to address as well. Um, thanks to everybody who attended this webinar. The, the next IUAS webinar is the 8th of June. Um, the presenter is Donna Farber, and she'll be talking about respiratory immunity in COVID-19. So thank you again, Catherine and Sharon, for your wonderful presentations. Thank you. Thank you.